is the month when we remember the whole of Des Moines. Several of us, Robert, myself, and a few others, 40 years ago, I can't believe I'm saying that, introduced uh, the first resolution in the Congress to recognize yeah. the, I'm sorry, what? Yeah. Had the first one introduced to recognize the famine. At that time, we were not yet calling it the whole of the morning. During that time, we discovered that actually that was not the first time a resolution had been introduced in Congress. That in 1932, Congressman Hamilton Fish of New York introduced a resolution regarding the famine, but it was not passed. Why? Because that was the time when we in the United States wanted to recognize the Soviet Union. And so nothing was to get in the way of that. And what we know about that history is that, yes, there were people who knew about was what was going on, but not made it, much made it to the public eye. There was one courageous reporter, Garrett Jones, who did try to tell the world about the story, and he paid a very heavy price being assassinated in China. And in fact, the reporter who published fake news and denied the existence of the famine got a Pulitzer Prize that the New York Times to this day has refused to rescind. That was then. There were other times in history, after World War II in Yalta, when there were many agreements made, some public and some secret. And uh, I guess we could go back to the Paris Peace Talks when Ukraine was not able to really represent itself, but depended on others to fight its cause. That was then, but now it's different. It's different for many reasons. One is that there are many in the world of media who are telling the story about what is happening now the genocide that is taking place now is being reported and transmitted. What is also very different and significant, that now Ukraine can speak for itself. It has uh, its independence for the last 30 plus years means that no longer can decisions be made about Ukraine without Ukraine. President Zelensky and the First Lady Zelensky are magnificent spokesmen for the people of Ukraine. And the people of Ukraine themselves are the best representatives of who they are, what it is they are fighting for, and what it is that they expect the rest of us to honor in a way. Tonight's film is a sequel to Winter on Fire. And if you have not seen it, I urge all of you to see it. It is perhaps the most significant documentary of what took place on the Maidan. And so again, the history of what took place in the Maidan does not have to wait for historians to write about it. It is already written in a most beautiful, articulate way. It was uh, nominated for the Academy Awards and I think an Emmy. Today's film, Freedom on Fire, talks about the perseverance and the courage of the people of Ukraine as they fight for their independence and their sovereignty. And it is also dedicated to the reporters who have died in the cause of telling the story of what is happening today.
what is also different now that is so critical and important is that, as I said, Ukraine has been independent for over, over 30 years and is speaking for it, itself. And we have here with us Ambassador Oksana Makarova, who is a faithful, determined representative of country of Ukraine and its people. She's been called certain names about how tough she is, <laughs> which I guess we can guess at. Um, she's quite the warrior. So it is my pleasure now to ask Ambassador Oksana Makarova. Dear Ms. Makona, dear Robert, and all the team of U.S. Ukraine Foundation, all the guests who are gathered here together with us. I'm truly honored <coughs> to, um, to open this year Ukraine in Washington's and beyond series, which has been here since 2011, and every year, except for some COVID disruptions, have been held regularly on a very special day for Ukraine, on December 1st and always fought for what is right, and always fought for everything important, for our independence, which was so hard to be achieved, but also what is important to keep it. And we're very thankful to you two for organizing this uh, premiere of Freedom of Fire and putting it in the program for the symposium and to open actually the symposium today with this very special presentation. Today is the 180th day of our renewed war, because as we all know, the war started in 2013, and it, wasn't pre it was prepared for many years before that. 280 long days, the Russian tanks again crossed the border of the sovereign Ukraine, attacked us from east, west, uh, south, uh, from our Crimea, we have seen all war crimes committed in Ukraine. There is nothing we can come up with that Russians did not do to Ukraine. Uh, and not only they are killing us or trying to destroy us, but they are also spreading all the propaganda. Evgeny Fidievsky is well known to all of you. His masterpiece, Winter of Fire, is an iconic piece. Everyone knows it, everyone talks about it. I don't know anyone who didn't see it. And I think this time we all will see the new masterpiece, which is called Freedom of Fire. And it's about the first six months of this recent renewed war. It puts the devastation caused by aggressive terrorist Russia on full display, conveys the urgency of actions and call upon all of us to stand up to the forces of evil. And it's not just a, a, a big word. We are against the pure evil that for 400 years have been attacking us, unfortunately successfully, and in this century it's up to us to end that and to win. This film will be hard to watch, but please do not take it as the catalog of Russian horrors and war crimes. Take it as a tribute to so many inspiring people who look for strength, but also give strength to all of us to continue fighting. It shows humanity, it shows beauty, it shows grace in places where you could never fathom under these circumstances to see beauty and grace. And yet it's there in the middle of the senseless war. It also reveals real heroes. First and foremost, of course, our defenders, Ukrainian soldiers, who have demonstrated that there are things worth fighting for, living for, and there are things worth dying for. And I'm so happy that we have one of him, one of them, together with us, our Dmitro Kazatsky, who is a brave defender of Mariupol, the something that is <laughs> Who was released in his 
smiles. Thank you, Dmitro, for your service. regardless of where they are, whether it's in Mariupol, or Kharkiv, or Kherson, or in our Donetsk, Lugansk, and all the cities in our Ukrainian Crimea. <laughs> we have seen, you know, a few faces of those journalists that we have lost in this war. We didn't just lose them. Russians targeted them specifically. Like they targeted my friend Max Levin, who had press signature on him. And yet, that was the reason to actually target all the journalists, because they are spreading the truth. One of those brave journalists, the TV correspondent Natalia Nagorna, played an instrumental role in pulling this film together so quickly during the war, is with us today. historical 
documentation of what has been happening. And we know that Putin's war against Ukraine is not just a military one. It's an economic one, diplomatic, but also, of course, informational and propaganda. Joining in this efforts of you and, and others, we are grateful to the many correspondents and reporters that have come to Ukraine to tell the story of what is happening. It's not just one Garrett Jones. There are many. And we are honored today to have joining us Holly McKay, who is a writer, a war crimes investigator, and author of Only Cry for the Living Memos from Inside the ISIS Battlefield. Her resume is incredible. I don't know how she's packed everything that she's done in just so few years. Uh, she has been to Ukraine. Uh, she went to early on. Uh, I think it was February, she can tell us about that. And then she came back, and then she was just there most recently. So we will ask her to share a little bit about what she saw and what she's learned. We thank people like Holly who've joined in telling the story, the truth, about the existing genocide. And so Holly, Thank you. It's a huge honor to be here tonight. Um, and just to give you a little bit of background about me, I've been a war reporter for about 12 years and worked in Afghanistan, Syria, Iraq, Yemen, uh, Myanmar, but there is really nowhere that I think I have felt so exhausted just from everything that's going on around me than, than Ukraine. I initially went uh, from Afghanistan to Ukraine in January, um, so I stayed there through to April um, during the invasion. And I just remember how, sort of what a, what a terrifying time it was, but just seeing the way that Ukrainians came together and just adapted immediately um, to what was happening was just incredible to me. And Pierre, who you saw um, in this slideshow, I previously worked at Fox News for many years, and he was a colleague, and I talked to him on the morning that he was killed, and he was just an incredible human being who was sort of the father of a lot of us journalists and just sort of took care of us. And, and I had a, an incident, um, it was a couple of days after the invasion, where I got a third degree burn on my leg, and not from anything related to the conflict, but it was an accident in my hotel um, with a, a water boiler. And he, you know, he really sort of protected me, and when I couldn't sort of get the aid and, and the help that I needed, he was, he was really there for me. And so that was just a moment. And during that time, I, I remember going to a mobile hospital of Ukrainian friends that were helping me dress this wound, and, and there was a wonderful nurse, and she worked in a burn unit. And she, I remember my mother was in Australia, and she was on the phone, on the speakerphone, and my mom is crying, and this nurse, Victoria, her daughter was in London, and she's on the phone crying. And I remember Victoria looked at me and she said, when you get a chance to go home, you need to go home. And this was early on in the invasion in early March, and I just thought, there's no way I'm going home. And I feel very grateful for the fact that eventually when I did decide that I needed a break, that I, I could leave. And it really hats off to the Ukrainian journalists who, who don't have that privilege to leave. They're there day in and day out, sort of covering this conflict from beginning to end, and that's just you know, something I see as just incredibly remarkable. I did want to go back to Ukraine uh, this year, before the end of the year, and for me, I really wanted to find what that story was that I think maybe wasn't being told, or how I could kind of add to the conversation a little bit more. Um, and I had an opportunity in the uh, beginning of November to go back with a, a group called the Mozart Group, and they were running evacuations in the east to areas that were mostly abandoned, um, but really very, very dangerous under complete bombardment. And so I went back with them 
Um, I just came back last week, but I was based in a, a place called Bakbu in the east. Um, and it is really under a huge amount of, of bombardment by, by the Russians and specifically the Wagner group as well. And what I wanted to, to sort of write about or understand, I think, not just in, in doing the interviews and talking to people about what they've experienced, but what, what it's like to live like that. And this was a city of about 75,000 people. Most of them are gone. It's really hard to know how many left because people are living underground. Um, estimates say around 15,000. You have babies still living in basements. Um, there was a 12-year-old girl that I met who was looking after her two younger brothers and she spoke beautiful English. And I remember she just cried when I left because she, she hadn't spoken to uh, sort of anyone else outside of her parents for months and months on end. And I just, the exhaustion, I just, it's so hard for me to fathom how people are still living like this. You constantly, you're sort of just standing there and you hear this terrifying whistle and it's going right over your head and then you have these two seconds of deadening silence where you're waiting to see where that missile landed. And then of course the explosion and just, there, there isn't a building in the city that's not destroyed. There's nothing that, its windows haven't been blown out. It's just, it's so hard to understand why, why people still refuse to leave. And the more you sort of talk to people, they're often older people, and oftentimes a lot of women. They're women whose husbands have either passed away, or they've gone to military service, or whatever it may be. So you see all these women that are kind of living alone. And I remember there was a 93-year-old blind woman, and the Mozart team that I was with were trying to convince her, you know, it, it, maybe now is the time to leave. This is your window to leave. And she just said, stop bothering me. This is my home, and I'm going to stay here. Um, and then you had a, a sort of another situation where another woman I met had actually evacuated the city and then just felt so sort of disheartened on where to go and what to do. And she came back with her husband and shrapnel um, hit their house and, and now her husband is in hospital and she's kind of left to, to try to figure out whether she stays or, or whether she goes. But this is just daily life for people and yet you're just under this constant bombardment and yet people are still going out, they're trying to collect water, they're walking their dog, they're sort of doing whatever they can to live a normal life. And when you talk to people, they've sort of resigned themselves to the fact that yes, I probably will die here, but this is my home and this is where I choose to be. Um, so it's a, a sort of a, a very kind of overwhelming experience. And, and as I was leaving back then and, and making the long drive back to Kiev, I really couldn't think of any other word to write in my notebook other than just hell. I mean, to me, that was just everything that, that hell is. There's, there's no 911 to call when something goes wrong. Um, and, and you find you know, deceased people in buildings because there isn't anyone to, to be able to go and, and, and take them out. And that's what happens in war. It's, it's every element of what we see as normal completely breaks down. And we see a lot of what's maybe happening on the front line, but what we see is, is all the other things that, that don't happen and, and the sort of lives that are, are really suspended when this conflict happens. So I think it's incredibly remarkable you know, how Ukrainians have come together. I've never seen anything like it in any country or conflict that I've covered. Um, and as one good friend sort of said to me when I talked about the problems that they're going to be facing during winter with the uh, electricity grid, and he said, look, we've struggled enough and we're willing to struggle more. Um, but at one point I really want to kind of bring home is, I think to a degree there's a, a certain amount of disconnect when I talk to my friends in the US about what's happening and a lot of people are really rooting for Ukraine. They've, they've read the incredible articles about just how incredible Ukraine has been and, and pushing back the Russians like nobody ever expected in the beginning. But my concern too is I don't want that, uh, I don't want that element to kind of lead to complacency and, and people to just sort of think, well, Ukraine has got this. Um, you know, they don't, they don't need our help anymore because they really do. And, and Ukraine is, Morale is their number one weapon, but support in, in many other ways, whether it's through aid, through uh, military support, you know, those things are incredibly crucial to happen. So thank you for, for being here tonight.
And I think without further ado, I would love to invite um, the guest of honor, Anton Leka, to the stage and talk about a little bit about the film tonight. Excellent, excellent. So I, um, I kind of wanted to start, first of all, with everyone introducing themselves, but I'd love to know where you were when the invasion happened and what was, went through your mind on that particular day. taking my audience back to my dad and telling the story from there into today's world. No matter if it's a long or short form, to tell what will look like it and to really immediately bring attention in order to stop this. Because otherwise, maybe not tomorrow. And that's what made me to start everything. But that's what was in my mind in the literally 48 hours since everything started. Доброго вечора всім. Мене звати Дмитро Козацький. Я один із захисників Асоставі і перші люди називають Вольчі Асоставі, тому що мої фотографії стали відомі на весь світ з Азоставі. Good evening, my name is Dmitro Kazatsky, and I became famous as one of the defenders of, of, of Azovsky. <laughs> and these photos became famous, this photo from Azovsky. In fact, correct. When we were in the second war, we were in the first war in the first war, and of course, the first war in the first war, so when Russia uh, announced its full-fledged war against Ukraine, I was in Mariupol with my garrison. Of course, I was shocked by this decision and everything that was happened, but I was ready to defend my country. I called my parents to see і згодом ми відсвітлювали події, які відбувалися в Маріуполі, той геноцид, який там стався, ці всі військові злочини Росії, які вони чинили на території Маріуполя і не тільки, але так як ми були майже єдиним джерелом інформації з Маріуполя, ми відсвітлювали всі ці події максимально для того, щоб весь світ побачив це все. So I witnessed all the genocide to the Russian army organized in Mariupol. I uh, documented many war crimes, and since we were almost the only source of information from Mariupol, I tried to make sure that the entire world will know and be informed about what was going on there. <laughs> So I'm very thankful to Yakena Finievsky for putting some of my video footage and using it for the film that he made, because in the future it will be used as, as a, a documented uh, evidence of all the Russian war crimes uh, committed in Ukraine. Hello everybody, my name is Anna Nesevan. So mine was 24th of February. I was at home. I was at home with my husband who's currently more than six months already in Russian captivity. I was at home with my three months old child who spent with me 65 days in the shelter of the Azostal steel plant. I was at home with my 
three cats and my Labrador, which were unfortunately killed by Russians. I was at home, um, which was ruined by Russians. So this is my reality of 2014. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for coming and devoting two hours of your life to feel uh, this horrific pain that Ukraine feels every day. And thank you for giving us the opportunity to share with you this hope that lives inside of us and that lives in all the Ukrainians um, these days. Насправді, я думала, що війна буде принаймні на, на пару тижнів раніше, тому очікували війну. Ми, як журналісти, бачили, як Росія накопичує війська, і тому для мене війна не була сюрпризом. You know, I wasn't surprised by this war. Actually, I felt that it would have happened two weeks prior to the actual date when it started, because as journalists, we have been constantly monitoring Russia's actions, and we saw this accumulation of Russia's armed forces all around Ukraine's borders. Але саме 24 лютого стало зрозуміло, що однією з головних цілей Росії може стати Київ, в якому я знаходилася, коли почалося повномасштабне вторгнення. But on February 24th, we all realized that Kyiv was has become a major target of the Russian Federation, our capital, where I have been myself uh, on the day when the war began. Um, you know, we felt that Kyiv can become a battlefield, that there will be real action, the fighting going on in the streets of our capital. But nevertheless, me and my colleague, we made a conscious decision to stay in Kyiv and to serve as lighthouses, as uh, messengers to the people of Ukraine and people all over the world that Kyiv will not give up, uh, to give a strong message to the people of Ukraine that we are with them, that we will continue hard fighting and that the Kyiv will not surrender. little bit of the sort of filmmaking process and did you know what sort of film you wanted to make when you when you started or did this kind of come together as the, as the war kind of went on it's both sides of the question a i do knew that i wanted to tell the story for eight years that they missed from the world's attention so I exactly knew that I'm going to tell the story of eight years. But I didn't know what would happen tomorrow because it's an ongoing war. So with the increasing the amount of filmmakers involved in the project, if in the initial fire we had 28 filmmakers who were around Square Maidan in Kiev capital, and it was during 93 days. Here we ended with 43 filmmakers, 28 and 43, you can see, 43, because I needed to have eyes everywhere. I needed to have eyes in every place in Ukraine in order to tell the comprehensive story to the world, in order to educate the world and tell about these eight years of missing war from the world. And at the same time, it was very important for me to step by step make people to connect to my characters and also to be able to understand that today's war is the hybrid war. It's not just the missiles and the people dying on the ground.
is also a medium for where the camera, like the cross camera, can save lives, but it also can destroy people's people's minds, which we saw in Russia, but which we saw also in many other countries. So for me, I saw exactly my vision, but I didn't know what I would film tomorrow, and it's ongoing conflict. But I knew exactly which characters now. Natalia Nagorna and my collaboration with Stockholm did a lot to discover a lot of characters. My team was looking for certain characters because for me, to tell the history of eight years through the characters that have been there for these eight years was the main priority. That was kind of different directions that together created Freedom of Time. And this is a question for all of you. When you look back, um, you know, at the past eight months, if, if you were to pinpoint a moment that really sticks out, that you think in some way really communicates what is happening in Ukraine, what would that moment be for each of you? So many moments, important moments, horrible moments, great moments that have been there. There is moments of happiness when people have been saved from other murderers down. There's moments of sadness where we lost lives of soldiers who've been in captivity. There is moments of happiness when we see soldiers being returned. There's moments of sadness where peaceful civilians being killed in the middle of Ukraine, either in Vinnytsia or in Zaporozhye or in Kiev. So it's, it's hard to say that there is only one specific because there is so many pain and there is so many happiness and it's all mixed up. Because you live in one day and you can be happy, and in the same day, you can be so sad because you lost something. So for me personally, it's, it's a lot of moments that I'm still living. I was just watching the reel of the journalists, and I and Natalia were there in tears because for us, it's a pain. You know, on the day one when I started this movie, if you pay attention to these slides, majority, it's a march. It's a march. And it was a real hunt on a journalist who were trying to expose the war. It was a hunt designated to kill the truth. And that's why, from the day one, it was my decision, and you will see this at the end of the movie, to dedicate this movie to all journalists, to all filmmakers, to all photojournalists who were there and who are no longer with us. I also did a movie after my done on Syria, where I exposed Russian crimes in Syria. One of my friends, she was an activist, Syrian activist, she said, if you're thinking ISIS or Al Qaeda were that, wait until Russia is what you want. <coughs> then it was hell. And I exposed this. And I lost a lot of friends there too who were covering those things. So it's, it's hard to go one direction or another, but it's a lot of problems. Last, uh, one last uh, command. Розділися кожен у кожну своє зону відповідальності. У нас зона відповідальності співпадає, тому що і чоловік досі знаходиться в полоні, і дуже багато моїх друзів і побратимів теж досі знаходяться в полоні. Тому для мене важливо говорити і постійно нагадувати 
всім людям проте я просто чотири місяці був у російському полоні, але зараз я серед вас, але досі, досі. Дуже багато людей там знаходиться, взагалі більше п'яти тисяч захисників українських у російському полоні і більше двох тисяч захисників Азовсталі досі знаходяться там. That is why it is my duty to remind everyone about Ukrainian soldiers who, are, who still remain in Russian captivity. You know, I spent four months there, but there are more than 5,000 Ukrainians who are now being held by Russian. Тому не має найважливіша місія скрізь, де зараз перебуває, постійно нагадувати про це людям, щоб ви не забували захисників України, які досі знаходяться невідомо в яких умовах, які не отримують медичної допомоги, які не мають одягу для цієї пари року холодної. Тому прошу вас постійно про це пам'ятати, постійно про це писати і не забувати про цих людей, які досі знаходяться і пам'ятати, що їхні близькі і рідні теж хочуть побачити, побачити своїх синів, доньок, чоловіків, дружин і дітей. So I believe it is my duty and everybody's duty and responsibility to remind the world about every, everyone who is still held in Russia's captivity. Please think about them. Uh, please put pressure on everyone who can assist them to be released. Uh, these days they also need warm clothes, they need food, they need our support. They have their wives, mothers, uh, children who think about them and we should be morally supportive and be always in our minds and our hearts with them. Знаєте, незважаючи на те, що найстрашнішими зі сторони і неможливо таким, що ми будемо найза... найкраще запам'ятатися, виглядають ракетні обстріли або якісь бомбардування, незважаючи на це, запам'ятовується чомусь зовсім інший момент. You know, probably someone may say that the thing that one remembers most from this war are the bombardments, this shellings, missile strikes, but surprisingly, on the human level, я дуже добре пам'ятаю, як я вперше потрапила на Київський вокзал і побачила евакуаційне поле. I remember the day I first uh, came to the railway station and saw this evacuation train taking Ukrainian uh, people who will eventually become displaced and refugees elsewhere. Але й був такий момент, коли немовля вже передали в поїзд, а і мама дитини ще не встигла завісти. І вона кричала так, що ну, я тоді подумала, що, мабуть, мені в моїх найстрашніших снах відкинутися саме ось в те. And there was a moment when a newborn child was already put on the train, but his mother has not yet given a chance to get on the train. And she has been crying so hard, she has been screaming so loud that I thought that for the rest of my life, this would be the uh, strongest image, the hardest image that I will always remember about this war. Я не страшніше речі, але ти просто їх запам'ятовуєш, але повірити ти все одно не можеш. There are more crazy images that you remember, but You can never come to terms with them. Одного разу нам вдалося потрапити до автобусу, який вивозив людей з Азовсталі. Once we got a chance to get into the bus that was taking people out of Azovstal. І на задньому сидінні спала дуже красива дівчинка маленька, 4 роки, в крутому одязі. І як журналіст я мала запитати її батьків, чи можна зняти цю дитину? And on the back seat there was a four-year-old girl who was asleep. Uh, her clothes were dirty and I, as a journalist, it was my duty to ask her parents whether it was okay for me to film her. Але всі люди сказали мені, що вона є не сама. But everyone told me that she is a long, lonely traveler. Це дівчинка Аліса з Зовсталі, їй 4 роки, і вона, її мама залишилася в полоні, а дитину просто люди вивозили, просто вивозили для того, щоб рятувати її. Щоб в полоні не залишилася і маленька дитина. So this 
she will not give help as a hostage to Russian army. Але, мабуть, після війни і обов'язково згадано того, як ти приїжджаєш в село, там немає світла, немає газу, немає опалення, а тобі на зустрічі від містері намагаються пригостити тебе пиріжками просто тому, що вони раді, що до них прийшли українці. And I remember seeing those villages being liberated by the Ukrainian army, that there is no heat, there is no running water there, but you see a lot of Ukrainians who run to greet you with uh, the piroshki, uh, with their homemade bread, with some uh, freshly baked uh, uh, food, uh, because they're simply happy that the Ukrainians have finally entered their village, and they're running towards you to greet you, to welcome you, and to see you as a force that is liberating their opponents. Якщо я просто буду себе рахувати, з того, що найбільше запам'яталося, то це буде довше, ніж кіно, але я собі хочу, щоб ви не втомилися і подивилися фільм. If I keep telling you all those little stories that I will remember forever, we will never get to the movie, and probably my speech will be longer than that. But I don't want to be between you and this wonderful film, so probably I should stop here. And where Keith gets the movie, but I, I did want to ask, you know, as a journalist, something that I sort of struggle with is when you go and you write these stories or you um, make a film or whatever it may be, and then people are very moved by it and they'll come to me and they say, but what can I do to help? And, and sometimes that's not always sort of an easy, straightforward answer. So I, I would love to get sort of your thoughts on, on what people can do once they've seen the film and have an even deeper understanding of, of what is happening, what people can do to help. I think we would love to see the reaction after the movie. Because I love this question. When people going through the same stories that our camera was, that our lens of our cameras will take everybody in this room there, where all these characters been where all these heroes be. Our cameras take deep into that of steel and motionless to the front lines of the war, to the streets of Kiev. And we will witness the history. We will feel the pain, we will laugh at the jokes, and at the end of the movie, I want to hear this from the audience, what they feel, and then we can discuss how they can help. Let's give it as a treat. У нас є вимоги, я називаю це все-таки вимогами і прохання одночасно. А робіть все, звертайтеся до кого тільки можете, для того, аби нам допомогли закрити небо над Україною і дати зброю, хаймерси, протиповітряну well, you know, Ukraine has a lot of needs. Uh, we demand certain things, and of course, we have certain requests. So please do whatever is in your power to ensure that the sky is closed under Ukraine, that Ukraine receives all the weapons that it needs, that it gets the hybrids, that it gets air defense systems, uh, that it gets enough ammunition uh, to support Ukraine's armed forces. Вимагайте звільнити людей з полону, як цивільні, так і військові знаходяться в полону. У 21 столітті не можуть люди знаходитися в фільтраційних таборах і примусово утримуватися в цьому. Please demand that all soldiers and civilians who remain in Russian captivity are released. In the 21st century, we cannot have such a thing as filtration camps and people being held by force against their will uh, somewhere in the, in the midst of nowhere. Будь ласка, не вірте російській пропаганді. Великі сили і великі гроші Росія зараз кладе на інформаційну війну. Для того, аби виставляти нас такими, яких треба денаціоналізувати, деукраїнізувати, розброїти, а насправді просто вбити та знищити. Please don't trust Russian propaganda. Russia spends millions of US dollars 
to its propaganda machine to convince people around the world that Ukrainians have to be denazified, demilitarized, but in reality, what it means is that, that Ukrainians have to be destroyed as a nation. And please uh, don't give up and please believe in Ukraine's victory as strongly as we believe in our victory. As we believe Ось ця проросійська частина влади прозвалилася. І здається, господи, нарешті от все закінчилося. А ні, тільки все починається. Ми маємо прийняти рішення про проведення спеціальної воєнної операції. Почалися ані удари, почалися бомбіжки, два скадинові через границю. І ми проснулися в іншому місці. Быстрее, быстрее, родники, закрываем, быстрее. Выйдя под мост. Детей, двухсотых угрозы, мирное население, маленькие. Когда уже становилось очень-очень плохо, когда бомбежки усиливались, я просто сидела и думала, как безболезненнее умереть вместе с ним. От жизни освободили, от жилья освободили, от работы освободили, от всего освободили. Ты еще и держава, и фашист, что он сделал? Его не может весь свет остановить. Мы всегда рады людям, гостям. А на этим гостям, которые нас пришли с мечом, мы не рады. Ребенок 19 лет, он еще ничего не видел. Он мне сказал, а кто? А кто, если не мы, мужчины, будем вас защищать? Мудрость за то, как мы сейчас объединились, я очень горжусь тем, что я конец. Central Asians uh, I know um, that are labor migrants that are joining the Russian army um, fighting on on the Russian side and how split opinion is on the war and I would love to see this shown in Kazakhstan or Kyrgyzstan or Uzbekistan in the Caucasus uh, and I'm wondering how um, how you change the minds how you reach out to those other parts of the former Soviet Union that haven't understood what's going on. It's always taking time. Initial fire took it from US, it started here in America. And later on, we saw how 2016 inspired different countries to start again dictatorship. People in Venezuela 
We are learning from the courage of the incredible people of Maidan. We are learning about the incredible spirit of Maidan. And I saw how in 2016 that I was doing this on the streets. In 17, 18, I saw Chile, I saw Lebanon, I saw in 19 Hong Kong, 28 or 29 of July 2019, 40 different places in Hong Kong where I screened the movie in squares and parks and underground and millions of Hong Kong people were learning again and being inspired. So I think there is a certain way to do it, but it starts from here. And unfortunately right now, I personally, Sean Penn, with whom we were on literally a couple of days ago, we both sharing the same problem. Hollywood is silent. And that's, for me, who is a part of the establishment of Hollywood, is really scary, terrifying thing because we have the most biggest power in the world. We are the culture that can influence the world. And seeing what's happening, it's really a fear that not only Hollywood, not cares, but is this silent. Is it a reason for that? Is it something like, is there is a something behind this, or is it just a non-interest to be involved in a current war that tomorrow can destroy the world, or being associated with the war, or is it a business strategy that they don't want to do? It's it's really tough to explain. He, Metallica actually asked Sean in her interview about this, and uh, it will be very soon on one plus one, so people can learn about this. But the problem that the reality of Hollywood really not pay attention to parts, like Ukrainians won, we will win this battle together. And I'm sure that so through the Hollywood machine, we will create a bus, and then you can give to Kazakhstan, to all these countries. Because I will tell you, beginning of this year, we asked Netflix to put Mitchell Fire on YouTube. And Netflix did it. And this was the window when YouTube still was in Russia, and a lot of people saw it there. In the same time, Mitchell Fire helped to explain everything about Ukraine across the globe in the places where people, listen, not everybody had Netflix subscription. So a lot of people been able to watch it on their own from the YouTube. And Netflix did it, did it for Ukraine. So I think. Again, you need to create a marketing machine, create a buzz about the movie. Because I will give you an example. We have right now in a cinema that I booked for this movie in New York, but people don't know about the movie. So you need to create a buzz, and then you can pitch into these places. Hi, I'm Stephen Moore. I'm president of the Ukraine Freedom Project. Um, I just had a technical question. There was all this great footage of Mary Opal and you know, like drone footage and, and that sort of thing. Uh, did I, was, was that a very opal? How did you get that, you know, when, when it's under occupation? Uh, there is different ways to get this footage. There is footage that Mitt Roy did and his team did, and there is some footage that we did from different sources. Okay. So, when you really want, you can make it happen. <laughs> Guys, I will tell you, as a filmmaker who did movies, when I came to my team on the literally last days of February, and I said, we must do this movie, literally, by the end of August, because the world will start to forget about Ukraine by the beginning of summer. That's the cycle of media. And you know what? Everybody said, you're crazy. What's the reason? There is no movie in Hollywood that has been done in six months, and specifically that the war was raging, we had the main editor of this movie is the same editor of Winter Empire, he's English speaking, he don't speak the language, I can understand the language, will not. And it was really nine editors, five in Ukraine, two, two in Czech Republic, two in Volvo, three was in Volvo who were in three months crafting this movie. So we did impossible in terms of technicalities. Hollywood not, not was even ready for this, that it still happens. But the determination of the people in Ukraine and the urgency told us to do 
thinks that is not possible for all of us. So it's exactly with regards to the footage. If you want some, you can make it, and you will find it. Well done. Hi, uh, Christopher Seidman with the Ukrainian World Congress, and also I'm an independent um, analyst. Uh, are you, do you have any plans to sort of make a follow-up movie to this, sort of uh, covering the latter part of the conflict? Uh, I will tell you the truth. And I, it's, it's my confession. When I finished Vigil on Fire, I was asked the same question. Will I continue to cover the war? And I said, no, I want the other filmmakers to do it. But I don't, this year, never say no. When we finished Vigil on Fire, it was 2015. That's when it was released by Netflix. And we were still filming in 2015, which allowed us to have the footage of Crimea, Syria, and Donetsk airport, in Bad Spelaz, and so on. It was interesting how at the beginning of this year, when it happened, and I just shared two hours ago here, what was my feeling in 24th of February? That was exactly. I realized that eight years when nothing happened, no movie about Ukraine in Hollywood, the world neglected the fact that the war was raging, and it's my moral obligation towards my friends, towards my colleagues, towards everybody to go and tell the story of these eight years and specifically emphasize the barbarian of the, literally, the war that outraged these days. Because you know what? If you will continue to neglect this, what will happen tomorrow? What will be the next step? Putin, do he cares about everybody? No, he don't cares about his people. He don't cares about anybody. He can easily destroy the world tomorrow. So I think, the world needs to wake up. Two days ago, no, three days ago, I think, we were talking about Holodomor. And Natanka said, they, and you saw it in the movie, they are not allowing us to collect our domain. They are trying to create another Holodomor. And I said, you know what, no. They are trying to create Holodomor for the entire world. Because the starvation can come to the entire world and the Russian state as the terror state trying to stop literally export of the grain that actually was signed by the Russia and the Ukraine, brokered by UN and Turkey, and they immediately broke this agreement. So technically, Russia trying to create the whole world for the entire world, and that's why it's important to awaken the world. Russia trying to fight the world, not Ukraine. Ukraine is literally the country that fighting for their motherland and trying to protect the rest of the world. Natalka said today a sentence that, again, I am learning a lot from my mentor, I guess, who is sitting in this chair. She said an interesting sentence. She said, we're not asking you to come and die for us, but help us to close the sky. Help us to stop this war. Give us what we need to stop this war. We're not asking you to die for us. And that's the truth. They're fighting for all of us. Because the appetite comes with the leader. And I was, I was in Calgary three weeks ago, four weeks ago, and we had a conversation with uh, a Hungarian Minister of Foreign Affairs, with Diplomats, and I said, if Orban's government thinking that they found a lie in Putin, Putin broke every possible agreement through all these days. And I think Orban needs to go back to the lessons that started the Second World War, when Nazis had pact with Russians, and Nazis broke this contract and attacked Russia in 41. So I think the world needs to know these lessons, that we are with one step in World War III, and Ukraine horribly fighting for all of us. So we need to be for them. We need to help them with everything what they need. Russia has launched against Ukraine. The world. 
it's not no. Yeah. There is, for, for you who fighting there, it is, but from the observer who been on the ground of Ukraine since 2013, who seen the war in Syria, who observing the war in the media space, it is the war against the world. And we need to really accept this fact, and then I guess we can realize our duty, human duty, humanitarian duty to help Ukraine. Because until we not realize that that's the war against the world, we will be silent. And I see it by the volume. But when we realize that this war relates to us, and it's our moral duty to stand together, you know, then we will stand together. And I want to also say something that today Ambassador Makaro said. She said, step by step we can do something. On Maidan, and everybody remember the Winter on Fire, it was a poster with a big drop of water. And it was a sign. Each of us is a drop of water. Together we are ocean. Together we can make it happen. Together we can win this war against somebody who's trying to take over the world. sacrifices that you have made or are making. You said you wanted to have a question towards the end about what needs to be done or what we can do to help. Uh, but I'm going to ask you for some help. One of the issues I think, you talked about the, the prisoners that remain, right? Um, 5,000, whatever the, the number is, right? Over 5,000. Over 5,000. I'm also uh, very conscious of the fact that so little is discussed about all the children that have been kidnapped and taken. Over 12,000, Natasha, what is the number? 12,000? More, more than 12,000 kids have been abducted to Russia, right? Uh, we need to have more information and we need to tell those stories as well. I mean, there's so much going on about the bombing and all of that, but it seems to me that that's almost a forgotten part of, of the war. So uh, I would ask you. No, I will, I, will, I will address this question. First of all, we still feel it. And uh, for the release of the movie that we're trying to achieve, we're trying to see distribution right now. And right now, me and Sean Finn and some other friends, we are really working hard on that. On a day we know that there is a release, we will update the movie up until the moment it will be released. So we will have completely concurrent movie with the event up to date in Ukraine. That's number one. It will also have some of the issues with the numbers. We will address how many people they was killed, disappeared, how many kids died, how many kids were abducted. We plan it to all be addressed in the movie. In the final version of the movie that the world will see in the libraries. So it is planned. Thank you. Over. I, I want just to mention that in the movie, because it was filmed uh, much earlier, as you understand, one of the soldiers mentioned that 160 kids have been killed at that moment. But right now, this figure is 460. 440. 460. 460. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, 440, sir. Yeah. And when we came to Ukraine, it was and as you understand, this figure doesn't include the possible number of kids who have been killed on the territory that are currently not under Ukraine's control. So we simply don't have the numbers. Часом, а ти на іранській стороні знаки загинули. 
regime that that was growing. And this figure also doesn't include unborn children, because as you remember, there was a footage of the Mariupol hospital, one of the pregnant women there. She died several weeks after this um, episode. And also, up to, after the most recent drone attack on Kiev, there was an instance of a one pregnant woman uh, killed by, uh, by an Iranian drone. И, на жаль, помирають не менше українці, декілька днів тому часто так, як на Сапоріжі померла благодарна дитина все одно все. Вона пройшла в Сапоріжі. And uh, there was, a, as you remember, a missile attack on Zaporizhzhia a couple of days ago, and a child who was only two days of, after birth also been killed. Summer, but since then there's been uh, several notable and very encouraging battlefield victories in Ukraine for Ukraine. I'm wondering if you say had stopped filming the film today, how would you, how would it, how different would it look? How would there be a difference in tone? Do you think uh, it would be more upbeat in the sense that maybe more hope that uh, the all of Ukraine's lands can be regained in a shorter amount of time than maybe we thought in July or August? I'm trying to understand the question because, like I said, I was still filming. The movie was finished in August as it was. We still filming and we're planning to update the movie with the recent events when it will be released. So it will be a sort of coda, completely different design with the events up to date when the movie will be released. So it will be a little bit different structure towards the end, but it will be released in the moment. This the events that happened up until the end. It means all what we missing between August and now will be there. Yeah. Hello, my name is Haney. I'm a software developer. I'm not Ukrainian. Uh, I'm from Egypt originally, and I was very, very inspired by, by this movie, um, having been in, the, in Egypt during the uh, 2011 revolution. It was on Netflix, so I have no doubt that this movie will make it on Netflix and other social medias. Um, the part I felt that maybe needs to be talked about, that many, many politicians and many people in academia here in the U.S. and overseas think or blame Ukraine. I don't believe in this, by the way, but blame Ukraine in this. Uh, they feel that, it, like, for example, Jean um, Mersheimer or other politicians, they believe that. So they feel that Ukraine instigated this by trying to join NATO, by trying to do this and that. I don't believe in this one way, just FYI. So I feel that when it, this movie gets traction overseas, there should be, it should be addressing those people who have those misconceptions and respond to that um, in the movie and address that this is not the truth, that Ukraine is the victim here, Russia, Russia is the aggressor. So that's the part I felt that maybe should be talked about in the movie as it gains traction overseas and people start to understand a bit more because there's lots of propaganda as well overseas and misconceptions. That's it, thank you. You're not fighting propaganda by creating propaganda. You're fighting propaganda by the human stories. And the only way you can tell the human stories is telling the human stories. So that's the way how you're fighting. And this movie is specifically address the history where I showed how long is the reality, true reality between Russia, Moscovia, and Ukraine. And uh, you know, and for every educated person, the majority, I am a member of the academy, both actually, also TV, also film academy. <coughs> we are well educated, almost every member of the academy is well educated. And I will tell you, no one can believe that, Yes, there is conversations, but I, I haven't heard a leader of the great, literally killed the entire city of Baturi. How many centuries it was? So you don't need to be sophisticated historical just to go and look at these things. So it's nothing to do with the NATO. It's like, you know what, I will give you an interesting example. Pope Francis did a statement, I think, in one of the newspapers uh, about Putin's 
Putin fights him because NATO is back in his back door. It was taken for Francis. It was very close. And you know what? You need to see that the day before, Orban was with him, and Orban said that. And literally, for Francis trusting the leader of the country, repeated this. And then, when you're asking him, he said, yeah, but I trust the leader of the country. He can't mislead people. So you see how propaganda happens. Now, you're not fighting propaganda by propaganda. You're fighting with the truth. You show me the truth. And truth is very simple. It's the human story. You saw an amazing story that Natalia was interviewing the mother and the child in a hospital, which fled Crimea in 2014 from Russians because they didn't want it to be under the Russian rules in Crimea. People wanted to be in Ukraine. They wanted to be Ukrainian. They lived peacefully in a very small place, also, next to Kiev. And we hear their story. We hear their story when the soldiers fight, uh, firing at them, saying, you are Nazis. So you see the reality. And that's the truth that you can bring and show to the people when you're talking about fighting the propaganda. That's the real story. And this story is much more powerful than trying to address direct things. That's how it's always. And trust me, if I will get attention of the Hollywood, it will be the same like this internal fire. This can change the history. Вони є улюбленою різновид російської пропаганди, такий російський наратив, що Україна якимось чином спровокувала Росію, і тому цей божевільний в Кремлі вирішив, що давайте, давайте ми їх знову і розбомбимо. There is my favorite type of Russian propaganda, which says that Ukraine somehow provoked Russia to start this war. And that is why this crazy guy in the Kremlin who launched this war opened everything and started everything that he did to bomb us uh, because we are somehow guilty uh, in front of Russia. Ситуацію, коли дівчину звинувачують в тому, що її зґвалтували, тому що вона була за нафту А це не зовсім про Україну. Україна не зґвалтована дівчина в спідниці. Це дівчина, яка дала нанесла ударну відповідь своєму потенційному гвалтівнику. But Ukraine is not a victim in a mini skirt. Ukraine is a strong country which pushed its rapist back and slapped him in the face. Я не знаю, чи буде Україна колись в НАТО. Мабуть, я зараз думаю не про це. I don't know if Ukraine will ever join NATO. This is the last thing in my mind right now. Але я хочу, щоб Була українська культура, була українська мова, залишилися живими українські люди, які відбудують українські міста та села. But I want Ukrainian language to exist, I want Ukrainian people to exist, and I want more Ukrainian children and people to survive, to make sure that someone will rebuild every city that has been destroyed by, by Russians. Коли росіяни заходять в українські міста, вони не бази НАТО розбирають. Вони збирають українські прапори і міняють назви міст з українських на російських. When Russians enter Ukrainian cities, they do not dismantle NATO military bases. They tear down Ukrainian national flags and they rename the Ukrainian villages, Ukrainian towns into the names that uh, Russians want to see on the maps. Ми розраховуємо на підтримку не НАТО, а цивілізованого світу та розумних людей, які розуміють, що може вилитися агресія божевільного маньяка. And that is why it is not NATO that we rely upon. We rely upon all uh, intellectually minded, you know, uh, morally and ethically strong individuals who understand what danger this maniac poses to the entire world. Для нас ця війна не про військові блоки. Для нас це війна за свою свободу, яку нам доводиться.
захищати ціною десятки тисяч українських життів. Це те, що найголовніше можливо ми сьогодні хотіли сказати і показати. Дякую всім тим, хто має слово це розуміти. So what we wanted to show by this movie is that this war is not about NATO for us. Um, it is a, this is the war uh, about our identity, about our future and everything that we hold sacred. Thanks very much to everyone who been here today and who understood this message and took it into their heart. I'm sorry, yeah, I, to be honest, I don't want to ask anything, but as a uh, Ukrainian and as refugee who was forced to leave my country in March because Russian tanks was, were about 40 kilometers from my city and whose family stay in Ukraine and whose brother serves in Ukrainian army. I want to say thank you to all of you. I want to say thank you that you was brave enough to stay in Ukraine and uh, filming the truth. I want to thank you that you not give up. I want to thank you that you defend my country. And I want to say thank you to Director Evgeny that you are showing the truth to all the world. showing us just the grace uh, of Ukrainian mothers. Uh, the children that we saw in the movie were so powerfully uh, resilient, uh, showing their humanity. Uh, to me, I think that is such a powerful message uh, of this film also, the resilience of of the children, how well behaved they are and how they're living in these horrible conditions and how they're gathered together. And, um, so thank you for showing us that as well. I think... <laughs> okay, you're gonna close it out? Yeah, I okay. feel like we need a moment to close this wonderful, yes. uh, deeply emotional, um, memorable evening. I want to thank the filmmaker, Evgena Finiyevsky, with whom I have a very strange personal relationship because we started the conversation of organizing film screenings uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, when um, it was first to be presented at the Venice Film Festival. And um, I felt the urge, you know, and today Evgeny has demonstrated this so wonderful to all of us that he is a true advocate of Ukraine, that he delivers this message that he deeply believes in. And I can only uh, be uh, proud that he, as not a Ukrainian citizen, you know, is, became a warrior himself and a messenger of the truth. Thank you very much again. Thanks all. Sometimes their efforts have not been public and maybe not 
fully appreciated. But with these little events like today, they have achieved something much more important um, than the big colors, you know, which are so famous in so many places here in America's capital. So Nadia, Robert, thank you very much for uniting so many people of goodwill um, who join this energy, this kindness, this appreciation, and who've been with Ukraine. Uh, you know, one very personal story again. I haven't been in Ukraine. I right here as a diplomat on, on February 17th. And then the war began one week later, and I have not been to Ukraine uh, for almost nine months. And having watched this movie tonight, I decided that two weeks from now I will go to Ukraine to embrace all those people who I, I realize now how much I miss them. So if there is something, an achievement for me personally today, is the decision to go back and to embrace these wonderful people who kept on fighting for all of us.